to talk about all of these. I'm joined here in the Beijing studio by Ms. Wu Changhua, who is the Greater China Director of the Climate Group. Welcome, man. Meanwhile, joining us, two other ladies coming from London and Washington, D.C. From London, we have Isabel Hilton, who is the CEO and editor of ChinaDialogue.net. And also in Washington, we have uh, Ms. Sarah Ladislaw, Senior Fellow and Director of Energy and National Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I would practice again by saying, welcome to our program, ladies. Thank you. So, <laughs> let me begin yes. with you, Ms. Wu. There has been concern leading up to the Climate Change Conference, whether China will be able to fulfill its promise to reduce emission by the year 2030 target. What is your input in this direction? I feel rather confident. I think China has made the commitments on the table, and I feel very confident that China will be able to deliver the target set, including capping the emissions no later than 2030, including our develop alternative energies, particularly renewable energy, around 20 percent of the energy structure. Uh, by 2030. In the meantime, dramatic increase in energy, energy efficiency by 60 to 65 percent over to mm. 2005 level. I think the reason I said I feel confident I think China will deliver because China has been on the track delivering that sort of targets and started to, 10 years ago, starting the 11th five-year plan. If you look at the last 10 years, China has been pretty much on the right, right track towards that sort of direction. I see. But there has been a lot of reports, uh, Ms. Hilton, you probably know this better than I do, about the power plants constructions here in this country, even though the Chinese policymakers have already made very clear those are the new generations of power plants leading to cleaner coal being used and cleaner technology. What do you make of the current stage of technology China has applied and will that help China to achieve the 2030 goal as Ms. Wu just illustrated? Well, there is certainly, these are certainly much more efficient coal-fired power stations, but there are rather too many of them. And if you look at, uh, you know, the permissions that have been given, what's striking is that these are not permissions given at national level, but at much, much more local level. And I think that there are a lot of administrative glitches that China is, is working to address, uh, you know, to get the entire country's kind of policies aligned with the national goal. The problem with building coal-fired power stations is that if you are, if China is going to continue with this very, very ambitious program of renewables, for instance, those coal-fired power stations are at risk of becoming what we call stranded assets. In other words, before the end of their lifetime and before the capital cost of building them is paid off, uh, they will become redundant. Mm. And that is going to be a problem because somebody has to compensate somebody there. Um, but, but, you know, the, the, the good side of what China is doing is that the renewables program is very ambitious and longer term it becomes even more ambitious. So, so like Chao I believe that the 2030 target is perfectly doable. What, mm. what the world would like to know more about is at what level these emissions will peak and then how quickly they'll come down. Right. There has been previous discussion, Ms. Wu, let me come back to you, about when China will reach its emission peak in a way. There has been different numbers. What is the latest? Can you brief us? And how is that related to what uh, Elizabeth just uh, uh, illustrated about the current concerns some have about China? Uh, I think the current current on the table is the political commitment. So we, the, the government said we're going to achieve peaking the emissions no late around the 2030. But if you look at the different other, the other assumptions scenarios, actually telling a much more positive story, basically saying if China continues actually its efforts now, there is a possibility that China will be able to achieve the emission capping by 2025, even somewhere between 2020 and 2025. There, so that gives you a very very sort of encouraging sign that China is mm -hmm. on the right track and we're going to deliver that. I think uh, uh, Isabel made a good point as well. A part of the challenge actually to achieve that sort of target is the coal, is the fossil fuel. We still have a big trunk of the energy structure. Uh, we rely on coal. So yes, the stranded asset, what do we deal with that? Someone has to pay for the right. cost. I think that requires actually the government and the public private sector working very closely, trying to address that in order to minimize the cost actually. But in the meantime, speed up the process to trans, you know, to achieve the energy transition towards 
a much cleaner future. We're going to talk a little bit about that later in our program. But first of all, let me go to you, Ms. Ladislaw. You've been uh, listening to the other two ladies talking about China's situation. But what about the United States? We understand there has been some difficulties for the Obama administration to push forward its original promise, uh, particularly at local level and when it comes to the business community as well. Now the presidential election season already going on. What do you make of the promise once already made by the Obama administration? Will that be once again stated during this year's climate change conference? Yeah, I think that the United States is a pretty solid game plan going into the negotiations and par probably the thing that they feel the most comfortable about uh, or at least feel like they've gotten a lot of success on is in fact the partnership with China uh, in terms of what was going to be put on the table for the negotiations and what each country is pledging to do. And I think the similarity between sort of, you know, China and the Obama administration is there's a lot of very uh, different perspectives on how ambitious or not ambitious their pledges are. Some people say, oh, you know, the U.S. 26 to 28 uh, percent emission reduction goal is, is, uh, is very easy to reach, and other people think it's very difficult to reach, very similar with the Chinese peaking target. And so I think that they both feel like well, that's actually in the nature of what they should be trying to do, which is trying to put something on the table that is, uh, on the one hand, very ambitious, but on the other hand, if you, if you actually end up achieving those targets a little bit more easily than you thought you would, uh, then you can actually try and uh, go for higher levels of ambition, which is a really important factor uh, in both the domestic politics of, of how you approach reducing emissions, but also in the negotiations. Mm. Ms. Wu, how do you see that from outside the United States? Well, I, I think Sarah made a good point. I think we all recognize the commitments made by the Obama administration. I think that's very encouraging to see actions already on the ground in the U.S., particularly around the clean energy. Um, one big difference actually between China and U.S. at this mm. mo moment getting into Paris is legally binding. I think from China's side, the commitment on the table will be legally binding because that's going to be integrated into domestic five-year plans that's going to be implemented, delivered. Of course, <laughs> that's aligned with the international legal framework there as well. But from the U.S. side, I'm not sure at this moment because okay. we all have the lessons back in the Kyoto process. So maybe the, um, the presidential office, actually executive part, could be committing to actually the international process. But when they bring that target back to the Congress and to get the Senate votes, right. in many, many cases, that's become problematic well, actually. We so better, I think that's the big challenge on certainty. We better ask uh, Ms. Ladislaw how big a challenge really that is. I know it's a difficult question for you, but you are the only expert I guess about uh, American politics and most of us. <laughs> Well, it is a difficult. It's a difficult issue. I mean, it's it certainly is. I mean, I think the negotiators themselves have found a way uh, to deal with the issue of whether or not the treaty should be legally binding, um, but it, whether or not that's going to be satisfactory for all of the different parties is still something we'll have to wait and see. I mean, look, I think that the the U.S. has been arguing for a long time now that as long as the policies that are being put forward in these pledges have a domestically legally binding um, uh, portion of it. And I would argue that you know the vast majority of what the U.S. is putting on the table is actually grounded in U.S. regulation and U.S. law, that you have all of the effect of what you need in terms of a legally binding agreement. The chief negotiator for the U.S. side has pointed out that it's probably not just the United States that would have a hard time with making all of the pledges that mm. are put on the table legally binding for everybody in the world and that in fact pushing too hard on that legally binding concept this idea that you need a kyoto protocol like treaty would in fact probably weaken people's targets and hurt participation okay you know, I'm not sure we'll have to see that play out, but I think that that's one of the risks of pushing for something that's legally binding. Uh, yeah, before I go to Ms. Hilton, let me just uh, press a little bit on you, uh, Ms. Ladislaw. You know, we when we look at the history, legally binding has always been one of the biggest controversies when it comes to climate change conference and commitment. Back in Copenhagen, it was because of this, not necessarily only because of this, that the agreement came to a failure. However, later, as we're approaching this year's climate change conference, China and U.S. side began to talk about whether they can work out a possibility of legally binding so that the target can be better achieved by countries, including the United States and China. And now we are really approaching the climate change conference. It seems that kind of possibility is becoming dim again. And 
it seems to be a very interesting ups and downs for us. Uh, uh, how much of that is politics? How much of that do you think is real calculation about really capacity of uh, countries to achieve the goal that they have, uh, you know, pat on their own shoulder and say, we can do that? Yeah, I think that it's a, a lot of it is politics and a lot of it is positioning before the negotiations, in my opinion. I think that what they've been able to figure out is you could actually have a legally binding agreement that allows you to agree to the process, right? Everybody can agree that they're going to put together um, pledges uh, towards the process, agree that they're going to participate in the talks, in the pledge and review process, all of the sort of parts of the talks that don't have anything to do with the substance of what you put on the table. And the substance of what you put on the table would not be legally binding, right? So those would be things that you can actually improve on over a period of time if you decide that you could do more. Mm. Um, so I think that there actually is a solution to this legally binding concept. It doesn't make everybody feel great, but it is a fairly effective compromise. Mm. And so I think that that is something that we could see emerging um, from the talks uh, that might be sort of a helpful uh, way to sort of thread the needle on this contentious issue. Ms. Hilton, is that kind of flexibility really going to be helpful for us to reach the goal? It's not just about the negotiations, in fact. It's about reaching the goals. That is what's important. That is what's going to account. It is, yeah. Mm. I mean, I think flexibility is essential if you're trying to get a global deal because you've got to reconcile the interests of poor countries, rich countries, big emitters, countries that are, you know, more advanced down the road of, of mitigation than others. So flex without flexibility, you, you get what you got in Copenhagen, which is a breakdown. People are really keen not to have another breakdown in Paris. So what we'll get in Paris is a floor. You know, it's not a ceiling of ambition, but it's a floor. So it's important to understand what people are bringing. They're bringing what they know they can do. That's what these pledges are. They're pledges that haven't been imposed on anybody. They've mm. been brought by the countries themselves. So there's good, you know, there's good reason to believe that, that this is what they can do and they will do it. What it doesn't do, however, is take us below two degrees. So the pledge and review that's just been mentioned, that is the interval and the mechanism for going back to those pledges and say, we're really not getting to two degrees, so we have to tighten uh -huh. these up. And that will be something to discuss in Paris. But, 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 the, but the main purpose of Paris is to get a comprehensive agreement that will be, be something we can build on going forward. Right. A comprehensive agreement, once again, is very important. But what is even more important is whether those goals are going to be achieved. That's really what is going to count yes. in the future. So what about those goals without pressure, without monitoring, which is without certain degrees of uh, monitoring and, and also legally binding? Is that necessary? possible that goals can be achieved. I mean, governments could be sloppy, okay. we all know that. Yeah, we, and there could be changes in politics, we all know that. So in order yeah. to make one conference success, are we sacrificing the real goal of having a conference, which is to achieve the goals, the targets? I think we have we're a not, lot of, I don't think we're yeah. sacrificing it. Um, I mean, it, it was true that, that, <laughs> that we had hoped that Paris would put us on a two-degree pathway, but the choice is between a less than perfect outcome okay. and no outcome right now. But the other thing is to look at what's happening outside the UN process. You know, since Copenhagen, there's right. been such momentum in, you know, Californian uh, action, in, in the action of city-states, well, and the fact that business we, is We could talk on. about those, you know, and we could people talk are beginning those, to understand this is an opportunity. We could talk about those bright spots, but now we're focusing on the Copenhagen conference because that's what the governments needs to do and decision makers needs to do. What about that? Are we really yeah. sacrificing, Ms. Wu here in Beijing, our eternal goal of reaching the targets by just having a flexible mechanism in order to reach so-called an agreement? I think it requires really the wisdom, uh, the best wisdom uh, in, in the global community to design the pieces together. I think what we have already actually is those pledges by different countries put already mm. put on the table. but. I think that's good, that's a very encouraging sign. But in the meantime, actually, if you do not have anything from top-down part, whether you call that legally binding or whatever, uh, there is a risk, you know, whether that those goals will be delivered, right. or whether we're going to be aligned with the two degrees target or not. We just cannot be make sure. So the best wisdom in Paris will be say, yes, we have all the pledges on the table bottom up. In the meantime, we have some key 
mechanisms from top down so that the two will work right. better or perfectly together. We're going to see how some of those key mechanisms, what it's going to be. It's going to be a very interesting and a hot process, I guess. Uh, another point, which is once again very important through years of a climate change conference, is about common but differentiated responsibilities, the divide between the developing and the developed economies. I've been asking this question for 10 years, and now we're asking them again. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Hilton, shed some light on the recent development of this debate. In the Climate Conference, this time in Paris, are we going to see once again this as the thorny issue facing us again? Ms. Hilton. Uh, yes and no. I, the big difference is China's approach, because China, as you said, is the first uh, developing country to name a, a peak emissions date, uh, 2030 or before. Mm. Now, if you look back at China in Copenhagen, or indeed China when the Kyoto Protocol uh, began, it was a poor country, and the attitude for a long time was, you know, we must develop, you can't expect us to take action. Right. Now, just look how that has been transformed. So you've got China still saying, common but differentiated responsibilities, but how it understands those differentiated responsibilities has changed. It's the world's biggest emitter, and the Chinese government knows perfectly well that without China taking action, this whole thing is hopeless. Right. Now, I think the, the the focus has shifted to India, which has still not got to that point. So India is, is talking about uh, a renewables program and mm. responsibility, but it's still insisting that coal is going to develop, and it's still insisting very much on the, uh, we didn't call the problem so it's not our responsibility okay. to fix it approach. Miss Ladislaw though. And it's a big, uh, it's the third biggest emitter. Right, okay. This debate has been used by both camps. Some say, but you both camps for specifically describing their uh, grand targets without really committing to it because they can point, out, point fingers at the other and say they're not doing it and therefore how can we achieve our goals? Mm -hmm. So Ms. Lattice Law, in order to have both camps achieve their goal, the United States probably have also to subscribe to this common but differentiated responsibilities as one key member of the developed economies and also one important emitter still in the world. Ms. Lattice Law. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that the idea that the common but differentiated standards and responsibilities would go away as a concept is a little too, um, uh, uh, not optimistic, but it's just it's something that's always going to be part of anything that is a global conversation. There, uh, there are different countries with different responsibilities and different capabilities, and I think, I think what the United States and and a, a lot of sort of uh, countries are are shooting for this time is the concept that it shouldn't be a major differentiator in who needs to do something versus who needs to do nothing. Um, the nature of the global climate challenge is that everybody has to do something. Everybody has to do what they're able to do. And so when you look at all of the pledges that have been put forward, mm -hmm. um, at, you know, a record number of pledges, everybody, for the most part, is putting something on the table in terms of what they are going to contribute to do right. in this challenge. You will, s you will still see the sort of common but differentiated uh, discussion come forward in how much people get for financing, how people are treated from a technology transfer perspective, how people's uh, pledges are judged from a fairness and comparability perspective. I think that you'll still see that theme in a lot of different places, but what's different about this negotiation and has been evolving is okay. that it's no longer a question of who needs to do something, it's everybody needs to do something. It is everybody needs to do something, but as uh, Ms. Ladislaw said, uh, be able to and should do, there is a, a huge difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, as, as one country would look at themselves. So Ms. Wu, what do you think about this, common but differentiated responsibility, especially China as an emerging economy now and looking at some of the others' argument? Uh, what is your input here? I think three short points. Mm. One, actually, the debate is already back to the table, and uh, so that's going to be huge Like risk. it or not. Yeah, like it or not. In the last 20 mm. years or so, that remains to be a major issue, the divide of between the poor and the rich and the poor. Uh, that's already back to the Paris process, so we'll see how that part is going to be handled. Second point, actually, is really what's reflected in reality is the financial support from developed country to developing countries, mm. and uh, there are a lot of commitments made by developed so world the that, they, yeah, they, that they have not been 
being fully delivered at this moment. The last point is also China. China, as uh, Isabel mentioned, that China's role has been shifting dramatically in the last few years or de decades also. And so China is an emerging economy. All so right. if you started to see interesting role of China, say I'm a developing country, but in the meantime, I'm taking on my responsibility. So besides all the things China committed to do, in the meantime, China started to initiate mechanism like South-South, you know, finance, the climate finance fund or something like that. You really started to playing its sort of role mm. in working more closely with other developing countries in order to address effectively global climate challenge.